in this demo, we will turn our attention from strings to lists. Lists are sequential containers for indexed ordered elements and which can grow and shrink in size. Lists are mutable and in many of these respects, they are similar to data structures such as array lists in Java. However, because of the way in which Python combines object-oriented and functional programming, lists in Python are probably far more important than array lists ever will be in Java. Let's go ahead and get started. On screen now, we've defined an empty list. This is a variable called myList. We can see that it's on the left-hand side of the equal to sign. On the right-hand side, we have a pair of empty square brackets. We've already briefly encountered lists, and so we know that square brackets are used to define lists, ordinary parentheses are used to define tuples, and curly braces are used to define sets and dictionaries. We can invoke the print method on a list just as we can with pretty much any other Python object. This is going to return just the pair of square brackets which we see up above because we don't have any elements in our list. As we shall see in subsequent demos, the print statement will invoke the rep function on every object in the list. Let's go ahead and create another empty list in a slightly different fashion. The syntax is on screen now. On the right hand side of the equal to sign, we have the name of the list class followed by parentheses, but you should be clear that we are not invoking any method from the list class. This can be thought of as equivalent to instantiating an object in Java using the new keyword along with a constructor. We could pass in a set of values which we'd like placed into our list, but here we have not done so. And that's why what we get back is an empty list. When we print it out to screen, all that we see is a pair of square brackets. Let's now go ahead and create a list which has elements in it. This is done using the same square bracket syntax which we see in cell 1 up above with the difference that we now have values between those square brackets which are separated by commas. In this instance, every one of those values is a string. We have four such values, badminton, golf, basketball, and tennis. When we hit shift enter, games list appears as a list with four elements. If we invoke the type function on our list, what we're going to get back is list. Remember that list is one of the three sequence types in Python. The other two are tuples and ranges. Let's now access individual elements from the list. We do this using the index of operator. This index of operator consists of a pair of square brackets along with an integer index. That integer index is currently set to zero on screen now. And you can see that indexing into the list has given us the first element that's badminton. As we can see from this, indexing in Python starts from zero. In similar fashion, if we index into our games list with the index 1, we are going to get golf. If we do so with the index 3, we are going to get tennis. Our list had four elements. What happens if we try an index in with a number which is equal to or greater than 4? Well, we are going to get an error. You can see this on screen now. This is an index error, list index out of range. That's because we tried to access the fifth element using the index 4. There is no such element and that's why the error resulted. If you come from Java, this ought to be pretty familiar. It's very much like an index out of bounds exception. Next, let's turn our attention to negative indexes. Before we do this, let's first refresh our memory. Let's see what the games list contains. It has the four elements, badminton, golf, basketball, and tennis. Let's now try an index into this list with the negative index that is negative one. And we can see that this returns tennis, which is the last element in the list. If we try with the negative index negative two, we get back basketball. And from this, we can discern the pattern. Negative indexes are going to work from the end of the list backwards. When we specify negative one, that's going to give us the last element in the list. Negative two will give us the second last element. And if we try negative four, that's going to give us the first element in this four element list, which is badminton. I like to remember how negative indexes in Python work with a shortcut. Positive indexes start from the beginning of the list and are indexed starting from zero. Negative indexes start from the end of the list and start from one. And as a result of this, we can take the length of the list, tack on a negative sign in front of it, and that's going to give us the first element in the list. Here, our list had four elements. The length of the list is four. 
we tack on the negative sign and that gives us minus 4. So the index minus 4 gives us the first element in the list. If we go beyond this, we get the same index error that we encountered a moment ago. We have now tried to index in with negative 5 and we have an index error list index out of range. As we discussed in a previous example, there are really no restrictions on the kinds of elements in a list. On screen now, we've defined three lists, integers list, float list and boolean list. As the names of these variables would suggest, they only contain objects of the corresponding type. It's also perfectly acceptable to create a list which has elements of different types and we'll get to that. It's not very commonly used though. To get the number of elements in a list, we simply invoke the len function on it. This is a built-in function which can work with pretty much any sequential data type. Here, when we invoke len on the games list, the value printed out to screen is 4. In similar fashion, if we invoke len on the integers list, the value that's going to be printed out to screen is 5 because, of course, that list had 5 elements. As we remarked a moment ago, there's absolutely nothing preventing us from creating a mixed list which has elements of different types. We've done exactly this on screen now. Mixed list is also the name of our variable and this is a list like any other. We can invoke the len function on it and the value printed out to screen is 8 and we can count and satisfy ourselves that there are indeed 8 elements in the list up above. Lists are mutable. We can change the contents of lists and we can do this in two different ways. We can either replace one element of a list with another object or we can modify the elements of the list itself. Both of these are acceptable. Let's see this with some examples. Let's go back to the games list which we created a moment ago. Games list still has the four games in there, badminton, golf, basketball and tennis. Next, let's go ahead and modify the zeroth element to be soccer. We've done this by having games list indexed in with the index 0 on the left hand side of an equal to sign. Then on the right hand side, we have a new string which is soccer. If we check the contents of games list after this reassignment of the 0th element, we can see that the 0th element is now soccer. We have replaced the 0th element. It used to be badminton and now it's soccer. So this proves that lists are indeed mutable. Changing one specific element of the list does not alter the other elements in any way. On screen now, we are setting the element at index position 3 to be equal to table tennis. And when we print games list, we can see that only that particular element has been modified. These operations that we just performed were both reassignments. We were entirely changing the objects at specific index locations. Let's go ahead and modify lists in a slightly different way. To do this, let's first bring up our integers list. This has the values 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50. Now we are going to modify one of the elements. Note again that we are not reassigning the element, we are modifying it. We index into the list using the square brackets operator and then we use the unary plus equal to operator to modify the object at index position 1 by adding a 100 to it. And when we print out integers list after this modification, we can see that that element has changed from 20 to 120. This is a modification. Let's perform another modification, this time of the object at index position 4. We use the unary multiplied by equal to operator. We have 10 on the right hand side of that unary operator. And when we run this line of code, we can see that the last element in the list, that's the one at index position 4, has gone from being 50 to being 500. It's been multiplied by 10. Early on in the demo, we had created an empty list with the keyword list on the right hand side of the equal to sign followed by a pair of parentheses. Here we are again using a similar bit of syntax. However, this time on the right hand side, we pass in various values. Those values are apples, bananas, pears and mangoes. This operation does not go through. When we run this, we get a type error telling us that a list expected at most one argument but got four. And this is because we need to modify this syntax ever so slightly. Let's rerun this command, but this time we'll have not one but two pairs of parentheses around the four fruit names. And this time when we hit shift enter, everything works just fine. 
the return value when we examine fruit list is indeed a list with the names of all of the fruits in there. What just happened? The first time around, that's on cell 28, when we passed in the names of those four fruits, they were treated as individual values. The second time around, those four fruit names, when enclosed within parentheses, were treated as a tuple. And this caused the list constructor to convert our tuple into a list. Tuples are very similar to lists in that they are also sequential indexed ordered collections. But the difference is that a tuple is immutable, a list is mutable. So this bit of code on line 29 converted a tuple into a list and that's why it worked fine. Do keep this little example in mind. It's an example of a rare instance where Python syntax is not very intuitive. This counterintuitive syntax explains why the usual way of creating a list when we have values is using the square brackets. You can see this now on cell 30. We've simply enclosed all of those values between square brackets and separated them by commas. This has the exact same effect as the previous bit of code and the syntax is a lot simpler. We still have a list with all of the fruit names in there. 